Stop. Hello and welcome to Business India with me Tarun. Over the years, Indian companies have emerged as large investors in Indonesia and the trade between the countries has been growing, especially in commodities like coal. In the recent past, Indonesia has started high or, or imposed high export duties for commodities like coal and bauxite. Where is the India-Indonesia trade, investment and bilateral relationship headed? Joining me on the discussion are Ambassador Bhaskar Balakrishnan and Sheetal Sharma, international affairs expert with the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Ambassador Balakrishnan, your opening comment on today's discussion. Well, Indonesia is one of the major Southeast Asian nations in terms of population, geographical spread and strategic importance. So our relationship with Indonesia has a strategic dimension, it has an economic dimension and it also has a historical and cultural yes. dimension because of the shared links, uh, shared uh, cultural experiences of both countries and uh, the people uh, to people relationship. So in all areas, basically in Indonesia, India relations have a lot of potential. So Bhaskar Balakrishnan sees a lot of potential in the India, Indonesia relationship. I'm going across to Sheetal Sharma for her opening comment. Just like Ambassador Saab, uh, you know, just now mentioned that uh, we have a lot of potential, uh, you know, uh, for relationship, deepening and widening of relationship between India and Indonesia. Uh, I would like to bring out the fact that Indonesia is the second largest India uh, trading partner among the ASEAN countries. Yes. And uh, uh, since the fact that uh, India's uh, look east policy has been, you know, now uh, being uh, changed towards act east policy, these countries of East Asia, you know, uh, many ASEAN countries, uh, right from Japan to uh, up to the uh, Thailand, all these countries are going to be the potential partners where actually India has a lot of role to play uh, because the fact that these countries are unlike the Western countries, which are the developed countries, more at, you know, uh, advanced stage of development yes. where they're much of their needs, their population yeah, are stabilizing. You're making an important point, Sheetal. Why? I'll raise a point. See, if we see the kind of Indian companies that have made investments in Indonesia, the list is long. It's Tata Power, Reliance, Adani, LNT, GMR, GVK, Trimax, Videocon, Punjloid, CG Power, Madhukon, Spice, Indorama, Aditya Birla, Bombay Dying, JK Industries. Almost all major groups. Almost problems. all major groups. There is SR, there is Spy, there is Tata Motors, Mahindra, TVS, Bajaj, Minda Classic, BML, Godrej, Wipro. So you see the whole list of Indian corporates remains invested in Indonesia quite unlike a lot of other company, uh, countries where India only trades. So do you think in a sense this partnership is slated or has more potential? It has potential and it is also deriving its structure or nature from the kind of, uh, you know, the social, the political and the economic structure of that particular country. As I have just mentioned right now, that the, the, the Western countries, the developed world, particularly European and uh, American uh, ones, yes. have reached a stage of development where there is, their growth is not beyond 3 to 4 percent. However, uh, and the, at the same time, their populations have stabilized in terms of, you know, that uh, their natural fertility rates are much lower than, say, sometimes in some cases, possibility of migrants replacing the, uh, uh, you know, uh, growth rate of, of the population. On the other hand, the countries in East Asia and South Asia are the countries which are now witnessing a greater momentum in the stage of development in their lifespans. And this is because of the rise of population, the rise of workforce, uh, the percentage of workforce within the entire population being uh, 35 to 50 percent of the entire population. There is a demand for education, there is demand for health so this sector. this demand there's cycle is leading to investments is what you are inferring? Absolutely. There, there is a whole lot of opening up of all these sectors in okay. which there is potential for us to go and work with them in synergy with the kind of requirements, you know. Uh, okay. Okay, Post I take your them. point. I'm going to go to Ambassador Balakrishnan. Sir, if you could tell me, when I read out the kind of companies that have invested, and it's not complete, the list is JK Industries, Jindal, Stainless, SR, SPAT, Tata Motors, Mahindra, TVS, Bajaj, Minda, Classic Strikes, BEMEL, which is the Government of India company, Godrej, Wipro, Balmer & Lorry, SBI Bank of India. So do you think that, in a sense, this partnership is more concrete because of the kind of investments that India is making? See, uh, it's clear from what you say that the economic relationship between India and Indonesia, unlike in many other countries, is driven by B2B relationships. Yes. So our business uh, has found a favorable environment in Indonesia. And if you look at even the U.S. companies who are there, 
or the, I'm sure the Chinese companies, you will find there's a long list there also. So the, uh, by and large, the ASEAN countries, uh, and including Indonesia, have been able to produce a, a good business environment attractive to foreign investors. Ease of doing business, perhaps lower taxation, better facilities, location, strategic location of Indonesia on the main shipping routes, yes. availability of uh, energy and raw materials, for example, oil and gas and coal and other products, uh, labor force, which is highly productive, and, you know, the Indonesian, uh, is by and large, the education levels are fairly good. So a lot of factors have gone into this. It's not just happened overnight. A favorable business environment is the main reason why all these companies in have fact, gone. Nalco has proposed a four billion dollar investment in aluminium yeah. infrastructure there. The so uh, the point will be what will whether this uh, what are the business framework in Indonesia? What are the laws? Is there corruption? What will happen if there is a change in government? Will uh, previous agreements be honored? Now there are some disturbing uh, disturbing signs. For example, if you have an Indian businessman and there is a commercial dispute. Uh, against an Indonesian party, then if it's a civil matter, but the Indian businessmen may very well end up being locked up. And so this you, happens. So, so, mean, so, so these so you kind mean of those things, are concerns. Those are concerns, and they, you know, uh, <laughs> if that kind of thing happens and there are no assurances that commercial dispute settlement will not be sort of elevated into a criminal offence yes. and arbitrary decisions are going to that be That can affect business. That will affect business climate. Mm -hmm. So far it's been a few isolated cases, God forbid. Even it shouldn't become a pattern. Yeah. But uh, these uh, things when they happen, they create a lot of negative but impression. But there is one more thing emerging out country. of Indonesia that I would like to even share with the viewers. It's, it's about uh, uh, Indonesia rapidly Im uh, imposing sort of export duties or very high export duties on commodities like coal and bauxite. Bauxite, it went up to 60% so much that it crippled Indian manufacturers who were dependent on supplies from Indonesia. Uh, I would now like to ask Ambassador Balakrishnan that when countries suddenly change track, how does it affect the relationship? Because India, Indian companies have made huge investments even in coal mines there. And when prices of coal, Indonesian coal went up, it led to a lot of internal disputes in India of power companies who had signed long-term power supply contracts and then they were at a loss of explanation that why their input cost has gone up. So in India it caused a lot of problem. Do you think sudden changes made by countries can cause these kind of problems and how will it affect the relationship? Well, sudden changes are not good for business, but at the same time business needs to be prepared. When you sign an agreement for uh, raw materials, you have to keep in mind that the prices can vary due to various reasons, including export duties. So you have to do two things. One is you have to be prepared and you have to put this into your contract. What will happen if there is an export duty? And you have to look for alternative sources of supply so that you are not at the mercy of one supplier. So in the case of bauxite and coal, it is not true that we are only dependent on one source of supply. There yes. are sources, Australian coal is there, coal is there from other countries, bauxite, there are other sources of bauxite and so on. So primary materials, we have to make sure that we are not dependent on one supplier, as a business even. Uh, it, it seems to me that business, whoever is importing these products, should have had the sense to plan for de possibilities. To de-risk. Uh, I'm going across to Sheetal Sharma. Sheetal Sharma, in, in, in the kind of emerging climate that it is, do you think countries like Indonesia are also growing more protect protectionist, where where they, they, do, they don't want to export their raw materials, they would rather have a manufacturing base there. Do you think this is how the world is changing, where despite the WTO and all, countries want to grow more protectionist? Certainly, Tarun, if you look at uh, particularly uh, the regional organization of which Indonesia is a member of ASEAN, for example, and the domestic uh, politics, domestic uh, social and economic conditions also, they also dictate much of the foreign policy and the uh, policy decisions taken regarding, uh, you know, opening up of the economy or being protectionist at the same time. Now, we also need to uh, look at the demographic character of the country in order to assess that why they are becoming progressively or even showing the symptoms or indicator indications that they are becoming protectionist is the reason that the politicians at the higher level, the state has to respond to the domestic politics and how they answer to the needs of the people. But uh, certainly, uh, the smaller countries are also now, uh, in the wake of WTO or in the world regimes, they tend to feel that they are somehow losing in the bargain and are being dictated by 
uh, the terms and conditions dictated by the powerful group or the uh, hegemons, if I can use that term, uh, by those countries and they, these are not in favor of the uh, small uh, farmers or small manufacturers or small traders within uh, these countries. The argument boils down to the situation that these countries have a large amount or large percentage of people, those who have small capital, small investment they can make and they run on small profit and uh, you know, uh, loss making kind of businesses. So what happens when they have to compete with giants in the western world, certainly they are unable to put uh, uh, out the quality that is required in the international uh, market or uh, you know, the kind of competition they can actually do. If we talk of India-Indonesia relations and why these uh, so many corporates are there investing in it, once again it's, it comes down to the issue of how relaxed the conditions of business or the business environment is. As compared to the, again western countries, Indonesia offers much more comfortable environment for uh, you know uh, Indian corporates to go and establish their businesses and at least it's, it's, it's the old world hierarchy, where do you locate a country and uh, where are you in the entire chain of dependence, you know, okay, that okay. Uh, whom are we dependent upon. I am going upon. across to Ambassador Balakrishnan. See, India is uh, a, a very large buyer of crude palm oil from Indonesia, one of the largest buyers in fact. Coal of course is there, there is minerals, rubber, pulp and paper. India exports petroleum products, maize, vehicles, commercial vehicles, telecommunication equipment, oil seeds, animal feed, cotton, steel products and plastics. The trade uh, has reached about 25 billion dollar levels. Do you think that it is uh, ready for takeoff given the kind of exchanges that we are being having? Well, this is a little difficult to predict. Yes. Now, you, you mentioned the sudden imposition of export duties on certain products like yes. coal and bauxite. Yes. Uh, one possible reason could be, now we have a new government in Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia oil and gas prices have dropped. Indonesia has turned from a, has no longer a net exporter of oil. So it is possible that the government uh, is facing a problem in its budget. Yes. And where do we apply the taxes? You cannot tax your own population. So the best, uh, if, you can, if you can put some export taxes on a few commodities and get away with it, then that would be one reason why they do that. Of course, if you put export taxes on coal and bauxite, then the buyers will go elsewhere. Yes. Uh, they go to other countries. Now, the other aspect is Indonesian India trade is uh, more or less like they are exporting a lot of primary commodities and we are exporting a lot of manufactured yes. uh, products. So, you know, among all the countries, this kind of thing is, uh, happens in, in the case of many countries where the uh, local industries are still to reach the, uh, the scale where they can export a lot, a lot of amount. Uh, whether that will happen in the future or not remains to be seen. The Indian companies who are invested there it depends on their business plans and it depends on their discussion with the Indonesian government. What is their long-term strategy? Are they looking at the Indonesian market or are they looking at exporting the products back to India or other countries? So this will, this will determine exactly how the trade evolves. But, but now the US is the only country which has a similar pattern of trade with us. The US has a lot of high technology products uh, the, which for their own market. But they export a lot of primary commodities, agriculture uh, and others too, even but including to us. But Ambassador Balakrishnan, Indian companies uh, were in fact lobbying too hard because they were taken aback. For example, the imposition of 60% duty on bauxite, which they will in fact cease to export in the next uh, one and a half years or so. Do you think that predictable economic policies or a predictable environment is a bulwark or say a necessary condition for any relationship to grow or do you think that as the world changes we have to be ready to face such challenges? Yes, I mean the companies from India who are importing the bauxite for making aluminium, uh, they I am sure they have looked at the projections of what would be available from Indonesia and they probably would have known that Indonesia is going to exhaust its bauxite resources. So sooner or later the export tap will be turned off either through export duty or uh, exhaustion of resources. So if they were smart enough in their long-term business plans, they would have looked at other sources of bauxite. Yes. For example, uh, Gabon and other countries in Africa. It's, uh, and they would have made uh, you know, appropriate business plans. Of course, they will make a big noise about this, hoping that this noise will persuade uh, yes. the Indonesian government to scale back the export duty. Yes. Okay. Uh, but you know, that's part of the game. Okay. Yes, yes, Sheetal Sharma, how do you see this whole emerging environment where countries are going more protectionist? Case in example is the bauxite and coal that we spoke of. 
See, uh, uh, there are two, three dimensions and uh, we would like to discuss about that in the sense that once again, uh, it is the nature of the investment that a particular uh, corporate is making in uh, this particular country. The political stability, the, uh, the nature of politics certainly determines the kind of decision that you take that how safe is your investment and for how long. In, in, in the cases of uncertainty, instability, in terms of political turmoil, situ turmoiling situations, nobody would risk their money. It has to be a long-term vision or at least a mid-term no, vision. When countries suddenly impose export duties, it suddenly it would affect an Indian company who's who's got. I'll give you an example. An Indian company commits investments of ten thousand crores in Indonesia to get coal. One day it suddenly imposes a sixty percent duty or a forty percent duty. That sometimes is beyond the realm of imagination Absolutely. of Indian companies. Do you think yes. that, in a sense? Uh, could hinder progress. Absolutely, it is. It is. That's what I was saying. You know that mm. nobody would risk a huge amount of money, say 10,000 crore rupees, uh, to be mm. invested into uh, a particular area, and then suddenly you find that uh, yes. there is a denial of, or the, uh, the tariffs have been imposed beyond a limit. Yes. That it is, there is no scope for the company also to see the uh, amount of investment coming back. You know, yes. not to talk about let alone the profits. Yes. So these are the issues which were always uh, problematic in nature in terms of a long term trusted partnership, e economic partnership in the sense that as far as the political decision making uh, remains you know dicey, certainly the people or the investors would not find not, these not are find lucrative destinations uh, to uh, bet their money. Okay, I am going across to Ambassador Balakrishnan. Sir, I would like to ask you, uh, despite the WTO being into force, despite all the talk that countries are opening up economies that should be done. Do you think it is more of talk and an action? Every country is protectionist. It's not only Indonesia, but that's the global trend. Be it United States of America, where India raised a dispute that in 22 of its states, it in fact had tough uh, import duties. You couldn't export Indian products because they had high import duties. So, do you think that in a way it's more talk, but every country is protectionist? Uh, well, I think we have to look at it from several angles. One is if the WTO had not been there, things would have been far worse. There would have been a kind of uh, law of the jungle as far as international trade is concerned. Yes. With no rules, no dispute settlement, no mechanisms. So WTO being there at least has helped to keep uh, protectionist sentiments under control. Now protectionism. Uh, the ma basic driver of this is the feeling of governments and people in those countries that they are losing jobs to uh, cheaper producers overseas. Now, you can, through protectionism, it's, uh, you cannot protect the jobs indefinitely. Sooner or later, the consumers in our own country are going to find ways of getting the product from outside at a, through yes. different channels. So, uh, the protectionist sentiment actually plays into the hands of political leaders who are looking for elections and decisions which are popular as far as that is concerned. So uh, this is something which happens in many countries. The European Union is no example. The textile producers there make a big noise. Uh, agricultural producers there make a big noise. Uh, it happens in our country. But uh, giving in to protectionist sentiments is not a good policy in the long run. In the short run, you may, you may get some relief, but in the long run, you can't. Because okay. you will not be able to compete in the international market. Ambassador Balakrishnan, if I see a trajectory of the past 15 years or so, we had uh, ministers from Indonesia inviting Indian investment. In fact, they went to the extent of saying, we hope that India would be the number one investor in Indonesia. So that is one government saying it. And when such kind of export uh, uh, duties are slapped, do you think in a sense that say in 2006, you welcome or 2010, you welcome investment you say that we want billions of dollars and we expect India to do this investment and then you change policy. Do you think in a way that it is fraught with danger, such kind of thing? Yeah, I think such uh, decisions and especially the way they are taken yes. will send a negative uh, signal to Indian investors. Because after all, if the government can today decide overnight yes. to put huge export duties, then tomorrow they can uh, take a decision overnight to put huge taxes. So how the decision is taken, was there a consultation with the stakeholders? Uh, who decided this in Indonesia and yes. on what basis? Was it transparent? 
was there any corruption behind this? Yes. So all these issues have to be uh, yeah. looked at and the investors will be worried about this okay. because if things can happen in Indonesia overnight to yes. affect business, yes. then uh, you know people are going to be worried. People are going. Yes, Sheetal Sharma, when, uh, when, when I take the trade ministers or the ministers of Indonesia making a statement, say only six years ago in 2010, that we would want India to be number one investment partner and then such export duties are uh, say indeed imposed. Do you think it's more of the changing global environment that forces the political class to take such decisions? It is both the global as well as the domestic environment which forces them to take these decisions because uh, economies, if we categorize them on the basis of the percentage of labor intensive uh, units in the capital intensive, the, the, the degree of small scale uh, medium enterprises and the labor intensive is greater there which needs greater protection as compared to uh, you know, the large scale and uh, capital intensive uh, industries. Now, the, 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 the countries such as China and uh, the production hubs, the, all the special economic zones which are competitive enough to challenge any producer in any part of the world, they would uh, be happy to have, you know, W2A regimes and the dictates of, uh, uh, you know, uh, these organizations. However, the moment when the politics is facing a kind of protest from the domestic uh, sectors in their country and in their economy, that the international rules and international regulations are harmful their own people, their sense of fear and the danger of not being re-elected or, you know, uh, being, nobody will commit a political suicide, you know, by aligning with the interest of the uh, international regimes and uh, sacrifice their political careers in their domestic uh, societies. So, okay. certainly they respond to both the international factors as well as the domestic factors and internationally, uh, the realignment and restructuring of the international relations between countries, that certainly defines, okay. you know, okay. how would in, they react. In my round of closing comments very quickly. Ambassador Balakrishnan, Indonesia sees India as a very big country from where it gets a lot of tourists. So there is a lot of income and it also their ministers also speak in terms of welcoming Indian tourists because it constitutes a lot of income. Do you see that also growing in the coming years because as India is emerging as a giant. So you think that relationship growing? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, as far as, as the income of the Indian, particularly of the middle class is going up, the number of the middle class is increasing, more and more Indians are now able to visit, uh, go on tourist trips abroad. And Indonesia has a lot of attractive tourist uh, destinations because of the common cultural links. Yes. The way uh, Islamic and uh, Hindu influences have combined to create yes. some unique uh, okay. uh, places like ba Bali and so okay. on. So there is a lot of interest, uh, there is a lot of potential attracting. So there tourism. in tourism, there is a common ground. Yes, Sheetal Sharma, your closing comment. Certainly tourism is one such area because we have a visa on arrival facility, first of all, yes. with Indonesia. Yes. So you don't need to do all the hassles of traveling abroad prior to going uh, you yes, know, to yes. Indonesia. The second issue is that much of the component of India's outbound tourist is uh, towards the neighboring uh, okay. you know, countries, okay. mostly East Asia and Indonesia, okay. Thailand. I'm taking uh, your point, but I'll have to cut you short here because totally out of time on this discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this discussion of Business India. Thank you.